In this section, we'll look at some of the changes taking place in science and in literature. Certainly, uh, in academia, one of the big developments was uh, the growth of psychology, sociology, anthropology, and economics, the, the so-called social scientists. People had, uh, were now taking the idea of uh, scientific technique to, to uh, applying it to human behavior. And on one hand, there was some optimism in this because uh, a faith in science instilled a belief that one could come up with social laws that govern behavior. The best example was probably in psychology with the so-called behavioralist who said that human personality was a product of the environment. People reacted to stimuli in a predictable manner. And if the stimuli were pre uh, repeated enough, uh, patterns of behavior would develop. And this implicitly meant that if you wanted to change the behavior, all you had to do was change the environment. Not everyone, however, was so optimistic. Some argued that this was bad because it would lead to social engineering. There were also advances in the physical sciences. The first long-range television transmission took place from New York City to Washington, D.C. in 1927. Obviously, however, uh, TV had not advanced enough for commercial development yet. In architecture, there was the growth of what people called functionalism. Uh, the idea that buildings should fit in naturally with the environment around them. And the chief proponent of this was uh, the famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, whose buildings uh, revolutionized uh, architecture and took advantage of some of the new building techniques and, and instruments. Another example of uh, advances in physical sciences uh, was the uh, development of the X-ray. Uh, Chicago physicist Arthur Compton won the Nobel Prize for developing X-ray in the 1920s. There was a, a little-known physicist at uh, Clark University in Massachusetts, Robert Goddard, who published a, an article that wasn't noticed much at the time in a, in a scientific journal, is entitled A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes. And what it was, was it was talking about the beginning of rocket science. Uh, in fact, the first successful launch of a liquid fuel rocket was in 1926, and it was complicated for most people. And people would say, "Well, you know, I'm not I'm not a rocket scientist or anything," but uh, the beginning of uh, the rocket technology, of course, would you know that impact uh, World War II, and uh, and today indeed our our space program later. And in fact, the, uh, NASA's uh, one of NASA's key uh, facilities is called the Goddard Space Center name for Robert Goddard. Goddard. The cultural conflict can also be seen in a new group of writers and intellectuals who reject the traditional American assumptions about culture. They, uh, they were kind of reflected the zeitgeist of the 1920s. They weren't the optimistic progressives. Uh, they sort of felt like they're, you know, you live life in the moment, you experience life, uh, and all these restrictions and rules and regulations all the assumptions of previous generations were kind of silly to them. Uh, they looked at, for example, at religious fundamentalism or prohibition or the KKK. They worried about the fate of democracy, and they're kind of pessimistic, and they became known as the lost generation of writers. They were centered in urban areas, and many of them adopted a rather bohemian, radical uh, you know, per persona or culture. They hung out in places like Greenwich Village, are in Paris, France, and they would experiment. They wanted to drink. They wanted to dream. They wanted to write. Uh, sort of the, the classic post World War One attitude. Uh, but they were they were major critics of of modern culture. One of the more famous uh, of the lost generation was H. L. Mencken. He was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun, who founded the magazine American Mercury, which was a monthly. American Mercury, published by Alfred Knopf, uh, was soon considered uh, required reading for cultural radicals. It decried the, the conformity of Americans, to use Mencken's words, quote, the boobery of American culture. Most Americans thought they were Helen Wheels, but they were uncultured and ignorant. For Mencken, you know, idealism, democracy, organized religion, prohibition, we're all exercises in futility and ignorance. Americans are mostly peasants, boobs, hillbillies, uh, kind of harsh. Another famous writer was Walter Lippmann. 
arguably one of the more famous print journalists America's ever produced. Before the war, he was an optimistic, progressive supporter of Teddy Roosevelt. After the war, however, he became pessimistic, rejecting the core values of democracy. He didn't think uh, rule by majority would work because the people just weren't fit to rule. They formed their opinions based on fragmentary information on public uh, issues. They didn't have the complete story. They were, you know, they what they they believed what they heard in the media, and uh, they could be manipulated by those in authority. And he and he cited World War One propaganda as an example. They were always subject to stereotypes and prejudice. He believed. Other members of the Lost Generation include Sinclair Lewis. He published in 1920 Main Street, in which he condemned small town life. He created a fictional Midwestern farm town he called Gopher Prairie, which depicted its citizens as smug but ignorant, sort of in a bearing, boring culture. In 1922, he published Babbitt, in which he created a fic fictional middle-aged real estate agent trapped in a stifling middle-class conformity. Later, he published Elmer Gantry in 1927, which condemned proper uh, popular religion. You might be familiar with the classic Burt Lancaster movie of the same title. Perhaps the most famous writer of uh, the Lost Generation was the writer Ernest Hemingway. He had served as a Red Cross volunteer on the Italian front in World War I, and thus of his, much of his writings uh, saw patriotism and wartime idealism as, as kind of silly. Uh, his Son Also Rises, published in 1926, described groups of Americans shattered by the war as they drifted around Spain. More famous was his 1929 book, A Farewell to Arms, which powerfully depicted a war's futility and all the inflamed rhetoric. Hemingway had a, had a terse, pared-down writing style. It was very successful, but you know he kind of remained unhappy and pessimistic. Hemingway uh, would live in Key West and part of the time in Cuba, about as far away from the United States you can get uh, and still be near the United States. He uh, rode at a bar called Sloppy Joe's and, and ultimately uh, he killed himself. There was also F. Scott Fitzgerald, who famously in 1925 wrote the bestseller Great Gatsby, in which he described the moral and spiritual disillusion of his own lost generation. To whom he said, all gods were dead, all wars fought, and all faiths shaken. Lastly, there was William Faulkner. He was perhaps most famous a little bit later on in the 1930s. But he was, uh, he wrote stories like, as I, was, as I Lay Dying. And he became famous by writing about the Southern way of living as the Southern society came apart. This, uh, concludes a section on the advances in the 20s in science and literature.